How's everyone feeling? Now, what, what I noticed through all of that with Corny and Mary and, and Jody and, and, and with Justin is how, how open you are asking Justin questions and how closed you are asking Jody, Corny or Mary questions. Have you noticed that? No? You haven't seen, didn't you see that in that interaction just before? And there's a reason for that uh, to look at emotionally because there is still, for many of you, the question of identity and 14 and all those things that I've been talking about as a truth to actually look at emotionally. Does that make sense? So, and, and many of you have decided, oh, I'll just put that on the back burner for a bit, right? And we'll just practice these other truths. And while that might sound good, sooner or later it's going to come up in, in, your, in your day to day life where people are going to say, oh, you're just now following a person, you're following a cult. Look, he's saying that there's some elite people and all those kind of things, which by the way, I'm not saying. But, but many of those issues are not being resolved emotionally for you. And so when you get an opportunity to question some of the 14, very few of you have, have a lot of questions to ask them. Another thing that I would like to point out is that the three of them who are up the front didn't want to answer your questions anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right? So the projection coming from them, of course, towards you is, don't ask me any, don't ask me anything. Um, I, I'm ter terrified about putting my life on uh, you know, display and I'm terrified about all this stuff that's coming up for me and I don't want to give you specific details because I'm just sort of trying to resolve these specific details myself and so forth. And so there's this projection coming towards you as an audience of don't, don't ask, we're here to ask a question, but don't ask any. <laughs> and so then there's that dynamic where there's no flow. Does that make sense? of what's going on between yourself and then, and then the three. And obviously I've talked to them about that. And part of, the, part of them wanting to do a presentation up the front like that is to actually trigger and connect with some of those emotions, obviously. So um, as for myself, I am perfectly happy to answer all your questions <laughs> about those kind of things. Um, and Monica, you want to start, do you? <laughs> okay. Hopefully I've resolved some of the sound issues, so we'll just see whether that's the case. I, I don't know if this is a question you can answer, but I've always wanted to know this. Um, were you all really close friends, like celestial friends, in the same sphere? And if so, or if not, how did you all kind of come, did you come together at the same time, uh, you know, as spirits to decide when you're coming back or what was going to happen or can, can you answer any of that? Or? Sure, I can, yeah. Um, the, the truth is that many of you have a concept of friendship that is actually quite distorted in terms of, and once you become a celestial spirit, you, you start, you go through this process where you realise really that everyone is your friend, but the people who are, you are the most attracted to are the people who are mostly doing God's will and, and doing the things God's way. Um, they are the ones who you feel the most connection with. So while, so while every single person on the planet and every single person in the spirit world you have a feeling of love uh, for, um, you also have very, very strong bonds obviously with those people who are following the divine uh, love principles to the utmost in their life. So, so how it worked in the spirit world was that um, as I was progressing through the spirit world, I would be the first person to enter a new sphere or a new dimensional space. That new dimensional space was created the moment I entered into it. Does that make sense? And then the, the next person who was developing and, uh, and usually that became Mary uh, as being the next person and then she would enter that sphere and now that sphere changed in its complexion to suit both of our, uh, the com combination of our soul and its creation. Unfortunately, through much of our progress, um, I was obviously ahead of Mary, so, so what would happen is that I would spend a lot of time in Mary's sphere and nobody, um, until the Mary entered the sphere I was in, would spend any time in my sphere. Does that make sense? So, so I've had the experience most of my life where entering a new sphere um, was, was a place where I was the only person there. So obviously, um, even though I entered that place and I was in a different connection with God in that place, every time you do that, you progress and you're in a different connection with God in that place. But what would happen is that I would obviously not spend a lot of time there 
because obviously I'm wanting to assist others to get into that same condition. So, so, so that meant that I had a home in that new sphere. And so every new dimensional existence that you progress into, you have a home that's created that's a reflection of your soul. Does that make sense? So I had a home in that sphere, but I didn't live in it very much <laughs> until Mary joined me in that sphere. And then uh, we lived, in a, lived together, obviously, until I made another progression into the next sphere. And, and that process finished in the 21st sphere for me and Mary, in that we both had to enter the 22nd sphere together. So, so that was a wonderful time from my perspective because it just meant that, you know, for the first time in my existence, I was not entering a new location without anybody being present to experience that at the same time. Does that make sense? Now, as regards the others of the 14, as you know from your own experience on the divine love path, it's all about your personal desire to connect to God. That's what this path is really primarily about. You know, you know that. So, so, and your personal desire to be real emotionally. Now, obviously we all have varying desires at this point. And to be truthful, you will continue to have varying desires of how rapidly you wish to progress and process your emotion and learn new truths. And every single person that God has created has varying desires. So there are some people that have a stronger desire than others as a part of that. So, and that desire, by the way, is something that you can grow. You are totally responsible for this desire. And by the way, when I say you, I mean you and your soulmate together as one soul are responsible for the desire that's in your soul. So in other words, you have the ability to have just as much desire as any other person in the universe to progress on the divine love path. Now that being, being the case, there were certain people in the spirit world um, and who, who had the strongest desire. And those people who had the strongest desire were the first seven pairs of souls to enter the soul union state. And so myself and Mary was the, were the first pair to enter that state. And then there was a series of, of, of enterings of that state. And my, my daughter, uh, our daughter Sarah, um, and her soulmate Luke uh, was the, were the seventh pair to enter that state. Well, they, were, they entered that state at a very similar time as the sixth pair to enter the state. So you, you could probably say the sixth and seventh pairs to enter that state um, were, were people that we knew, obviously. Um, so that being, the, that, that being the case, though, there's been many people who I know who have entered that state after that point, but I, who I have not had as much personal contact with. You look at how it happens here, right? Many of you have noticed already that what I'm trying to do is to help the persons who have the strongest desire to progress spiritually. That's my personal goal. Now, many people who don't have a strong desire to progress spiritually have a strong desire to deal with their emotions, but only because they wish to negate the negative effects of not dealing with their emotions. Do you, do you follow me? It's a bit like, so it's a bit like, oh, I'm feeling really painful now. AJ, you've got to help me. Now, I feel quite resistive to helping a person in that state. The reason why is because I can feel that there is not a strong desire for them to be at one with God. There's not a strong desire for them to be truthful. There's not a strong desire for them to, to connect with all of these emotions within them, except when they're in pain. And then they have a desire, and the, the desire really is only to avoid their pain. And that's not a pure desire. Can you see that? It's not like, let's say you and I have a friendship only because um, you want to avoid some pain. Does that sound like a good friendship to you? Well, that's the kind of friendship many of us are trying to develop with God. Right? We, say, we say, oh, I only want God because he's going to help me avoid some pain. Well, the truth is that that's not a pure desire. And so therefore, we've already got an issue with our relationship with God. So getting back to the description, what happened was that there were a group of people, many of them from our first century experience, who had a very passionate and strong desire to connect with God. So the Apostle John and his soulmate from the first century, uh, both males, were the ones who had the next strongest desire, given also their background in the first century. So, so their background in the first century was that John met me at a relatively young age 
I had spent a lot of my years before I became at one with God working with them. I used to work fixing their nets as fishermen. So, um, so when I lived in Capernaum, you know, which is a place on the Sea of uh, Galilee um, in the first century, what would happen was that I, I would obviously interact, to relate with them and spend a lot of time talking about God and talking about truth and talking about things that were becoming truth for me. Now, as a result of that, obviously, they developed a lot of interest in the truth as well, just like many of you have done, just by our interactions, you know, with regard to hearing different aspects of truth. And, and a strong friendship developed between myself and, and John and his brother uh, as well, James, and also others uh, who worked. Peter was one of those who worked as a fisherman. And, he, you know, there was a bond that got developed in, the, in that process. But that be, being the case, not all of those people dealt with their emotions. In fact, very few of them, while I was on earth in the first century, dealt with any emotions. Um, and in fact, um, Mary probably dealt with her emotions the most, and then John was probably the next person who dealt with his emotions. Um, but after that, many of the men in particular struggled uh, dealing with any emotions. And many of the women were very oppressed and in states of heightened fear. And so they found it quite difficult some, at times also to deal with their emotions while they were on earth. So what happened for many was that uh, they still acted out many of their emotional issues while they were on earth. So the Apostle Peter, for example, who you call the Apostle Peter, Peter, uh, my friend Peter, he, he uh, was a man who had a lot of issues with women. He had a lot of uh, uh, feelings of um, dominance over women. He, uh, he had a feeling of care for them as well, but more in an autocratic, authoritarian manner. Um, he felt he knew better than women. He felt that women uh, shouldn't be considered. And uh, in many occasions, he actually didn't consider women, even when he was traveling with me and following me around on earth. Now, when he, obviously, when he passed, he had a lot of emotions to deal with about that. Does that make sense? which actually finishes up retarding his progression in the spirit world as well. Because when you're in a state where you feel deserved of your position, and that position is an, a position of oppressing others, there are actually more damaging emotions in your soul to actually release than there is if you were in the state of being oppressed by the other. Does that make sense to everyone? The, the actual process of oppressing another person creates more soul damage within yourself than being oppressed by another person does. Now, because of that, when Peter passed over, obviously he had quite a lot of dark emotions to work his way through. He had a strong feeling all the time that he was on earth uh, with me when I was alive, that he knew better than I did about most subjects. <laughs> and he would often, um, I would often have conversations with him about um, how, he, how he would feel that um, he would often be questioning me. He would often be saying to me things like, um, for example, you know, do you think really that you should treat women the way you do? For example, was one of, the, one of the conversations we would often have. Really what he was saying to me is, I don't think you should treat women the way you do. Now, many of us do this, right? Many of us ask questions saying something, but really what we should be doing is making a statement <laughs> of how we really feel. And so he would often be asking me questions like, why do you treat women the way you do? And no matter how much explanation I'd give about the soulmates, the soul halves, and how we're equal as a soul, really by harming a woman, you're harming yourself, you know, because, because the other half of you is, is, in Peter's case, was a woman. So, so you know, no matter how much explanation I gave of that, he still felt that he knew better than women, and he still believed that, and he didn't release the emotion of that. And so when he passed over in the spirit world, he obviously had quite a large group of emotions to deal with. Not only that, he also had set himself up as the sort of leader, the de facto leader of the others who would follow around. Uh, he was one of the oldest, and so therefore, back in uh, our day in the first century, obviously uh, age had a huge effect upon whether you'd listen to somebody or not. So if you were aged, generally you got far more respect than if you were younger. And so he demanded respect from many of the disciples and, and, and often received it without without any justification and but of course when he passed he also had that, that emotion to deal with does that make sense so he had these series of emotions to deal with that slowed and retarded his own progression when he passed into the spirit world 
which meant that others that he had oppressed while he was on earth, including my soulmate, but also others, and that he had oppressed like John, the Apostle John, progressed faster because they had actually been on the receiving end of that kind of treatment. Does that make sense? And my, my friend Peter is still my friend, as he's always been. He's now a celestial spirit without any of these emotions. So he doesn't, he, he doesn't have this thing of like, oh, oh now AJ's talking about me. Like, Jesus, yeah, his feelings are, you know, Yeshua is talking about me again, you know, like as an example. He doesn't feel like that at all. He just, he just recognises that that was his personality and his emotional set of injuries at the time. But the effect of that is that it retarded his progression and therefore retarded the progression between him and his soulmate. You can, you can see that, can't you? If you've got lots of opposite gender injuries that you haven't worked your way through on earth, you pass in the spirit world and you're still struggling to work your way through them. So what, what happens is that you finish up retarding the progression of your combined soul. And this is why it's so important to deal with these intergender emotional injuries. So you retard the progression of, divine, of, your, of your own soul. So that means then that other people who are not having those particular injuries and also have a strong desire to be closer to God, they pass, pass you in terms of the amount of love that they receive from God. So, so you can sort of liken this journey on the divine love path that was once well, likened by a spirit uh, to a medium that I know to be like a driving along a freeway you know, you might be all driving from here to Brisbane, right? But, you know, if we all got in the car right now together and we got in the car and drove out of the venue here and up to Butterham and then down to the highway and up to, you know, up all the way through, what we would finish up happening is some of us would get ahead of others. Some of us would pull over on the side of the road at the service station, fill up with fuel. Some of us will stop on the side of the road for other reasons. Some of us may even have a prank, like may even have a crash on the way there right and who knows what might happen because of that and so there's all these different things that will happen as a result but at the end we're all heading towards Brisbane when we're on that highway and it's really the same with the divine love path is when you start comparing yourself and your own progression to others obviously there is a damaging emotion driving that but there is also no need for that because in the end this is not about me comparing my progression with yourself. It's about me wanting to be closer to God at every single moment of my existence. Right? And me wanting to be closer to love every single moment of my existence. And so you, after a while you start forgetting about what other people are doing on the path and you start focusing on what you need to do or what you want to do. Not just what you need to do, but what you want to do inside of yourself. Now, there were seven soul pairs who made that choice very early in their progression and they became the first seven pairs to reach the soul union state. Does that make sense? And, and while we had, and of course we had deep friendships throughout that entire 2,000 years of time because the more somebody wants to get closer to God and get closer to the truth, the more they are in love with my own nature and so therefore I feel far more rapport with them than a person who wants to keep resisting the divine truth all the time and keep trying to stop their progression and so forth. And you'll find the same in your own progression. Who you will draw into your field will be very much about where you're at at the time and what your desire is at the time. And that's the case all the time. So as we progress through the spheres of the spirit world, many of us then, and um, what happens is as you progress, you get assigned by God specific duties, if you like. So you have sort of like, you have like your personal life, if you could think of it that way, right? And then you have your public life, which is actually very different in many cases to your personal life. When I say different, it's not different in the sense that you are separated uh, psychologically or, or from your emotions when you're doing either. But one is a place where you've been appointed by God to do a task. The other one is just you're allowed living your life um, how you want to live your life. Now, the way to get appointed by God to do a task is by having a desire for that task. So the, the first seven soul pairs to enter the union state all had very, very specific desires of how much they wanted to assist people and help people and so forth. If you look at the channeled messages of the pageant messages, you'll see that like Luke was very, very present in those messages, wasn't he? And that's because he has such a desire to teach. He's always had a passion for language. He's always had a passion for truth. He's very, very similar in nature to myself. 
And, and so, so we, myself and Luke, have, have had a deep friendship all of our existence. Um, there's been, you see that John is very dominant or prominent in those messages. And that's because John is also very similar. He's got a very similar nature in that he, he loves to teach and help others and so forth. But there are others that are less prominent in the messages but are still ones of the 14. So, for instance, Cornelius is in the message twice, only twice. And, um, but he could have been in the messages more. But the issue that was faced by most of us in terms of delivery of truth to the earth was the person who was listening, who was Paget at this time, would have gone, Cornelius, you mean the man who killed Jesus? Um, uh, you know, I'm not sure about you, you know what I mean? So there would have been automatically, due to his, and I'm going to say there is, automatically due to his emotions about my life and who killed me and all those other things, a resistance to hearing from the people who did it. <coughs> Excuse me. And the same applies with like Judas. Judas who had plenty of opportunity to talk, uh, teach to uh, others as a spirit under the earth. But of course, there's been very few people who really want to connect to him because all they think whenever they hear of Judas is the words betrayal and Judas are like synonymous. And so there's a huge amount of emotions coming from a person towards the spirit. So, so in the end, a lot of times what happened in the pageant messages wasn't a true reflection of the condition of the spirits who were speaking. So, so many of the spirits who uh, could have spoken through Paget couldn't because of specific reasons to do with his emotional condition. Does that make sense? But we as a group were very, very close with each other in the spirit world very early on. And so therefore had a lot to do with each other. To, to, for me, uh, every time I've met one of the 14, it's like recognising one of my family again. Um, they don't always have the same emotion with me, mind you. In fact, most of them don't. Most of them have the opposite emotion with me. They want to avoid me like the plague. And there's a whole set of emotional reasons for that. One of the emotional reasons is if, if you meet a person who's totally open emotionally towards a specific idea or concept that is inside of you in denial, then, then interacting with that person in that moment is going to be very difficult for you. It's a bit like you you wanting to shut down all of your tears and then going and watching a movie that's just a tearful movie all the way through. You come out of it going, oh, that was boring, you know. Like, where's the action movie, you know? And the reason why is because we already have this predisposition in our soul emotionally to, to deny a certain emotional experience. And so, so most of the 14, as you've seen with Mary and Corny and Jody, um, most of the 14 have some very, very strong fears about even acknowledging their own uh, condition and who they are. Now, of course, I've been through the same process. The only difference is I didn't go through it in a public manner. That's the only difference. So the emotions that Mary's going through, the emotions that Corny's going through, the emotion that Jody's going through, that you see them going through up here. And in Justin's case, he's had the unique experience of seeing one of the 14 go through those emotions you know, in a more private setting and there's been uh, some others who have had that same situation occur but for the majority of you you haven't noticed me go through all of those emotions. You've seen me change in two years or the two or three years that you've known me but you don't know what I've done in private. But the others of the 14 are being brave enough to demonstrate to you what they're doing in private which I feel is a very positive thing for you. Um, because it actually demonstrates what I've had to go through. Now, I've had to go through all of those things. So I've had to go through all of that same fear that nobody's going to believe me if I say the truth. I've had to go up in front of audiences talking about divine truth and just get hammered by the audience. And I've gone through lots and lots of different emotions of the process of all of that and come out of the other end by feeling like I don't have those emotions anymore. But every one of the 14, in fact, needs to go through that process emotionally and it's not something that, that it's an individual thing you can't uh, change how you know that in another person so while like Corny mentioned to you in the previous prior to the break how he feels a lot of mistrust and I feel his mistrust a lot and in terms of my own emotions about it I feel very quite sad about it at times and I've had to process about that because for me like I remember him and I remember my love for him and I, I feel all these feelings for him and, uh, and obviously um, you know I, I feel quite
quite differently to him. Like I feel like I know I can trust him, I know who he is. And, I, and although I know his emotional condition, um, I, I also have a deep love for him that's been a love that's been present for 2000 years. So obviously there's a lot in that for me, right? And the same applies to obviously to Mary even more so for me. And the same applies to Jody and the same applies to every one of the 14 that I feel. But for, so we've had this really close, strong bond. And one of my deep emotions that I've had to work my way through is how we don't have that bond now. Myself and Mary are yet to re-establish that bond, let alone myself and any of the, uh, of the others of the 14. Um, because it's a totally different place than what you can imagine here on earth with regard to friendship. So, um, so I've had a lot of emotions to work my way through about how I'm, of, of all the people that reject me the most, the 14 reject me the most on the planet. And, uh, and until they probably work through that emotion, uh, it, it will be very difficult for many of them to progress very well at all. Some of them have trusted me to a certain degree for a certain period of time. And then I've hit an emotion and uh, an emotion that's uh, caused them to go into rage and anger. And then they get into a rage and anger with me. And, and I feel that very deeply, like far more than any of you getting angry with me, do I feel one of the 14 getting angry with me? Because I'm obviously very open to, their, to them. And, and so I've had a lot of emotions to deal with about that, about feeling sort of, um, that I've lost all my friends type emotion uh, that I've had for a long, long time. And so um, in the spirit world, none of those obviously feelings are there because obviously you're all together progressing and enjoying each other's company. And you have a lot more fun than what you probably believe here on earth based on processing your emotions at this point. <laughs> but um, you know, you're obviously living in bliss. And so um, everything you do works beautifully. And the only things that don't are related to the earth because of the condition of the earth generally. Um, everything else we work through, obviously you're working with the will of the individual each time, but it's a beautiful place to be where you're totally harmonious with love of yourself, love of others, love of God, and just to be working your way through like that. And then having a group of friends doing it and having those group of friends in almost the same condition of yourself, it's just a wonderful experience. Like just. And many of you have already started connecting to some of those emotions, right? With pe other people here, feeling that rapport, feeling that friendship, feeling that the friendship is much deeper than friends you've had for, hun for, for hundreds of years, uh, <laughs> friends you've had for years and years and years, right? Can you see that why though? Because, because now you can be real, they're allowed to be real, you're allowed to be real, you're allowed to have an emotional experience right in front of them, they don't judge you for that, there's a lot of openness about that, so what, what are they feeling? What, and what are you feeling? You're feeling much more connection, a stronger bond with them, you can feel you be open and, and free with them. It's just so wonderful to have friends like that. And so we grew up, uh, you know, when I say we grew up, we grew from the you know, first celestial sphere into the 22nd sphere state in that soul union state, experiencing a lot of that joy, uh, which I miss terribly. Um, and I've had a lot of grief uh, processed about that. I was just processing some a couple of weeks ago, in fact, uh, some more grief about that. Mm. Um, does that answer your question? I can't even remember what your question was now. Pretty much, and I suppose it's very human thinking that there was one day or one moment you came together and decided to do it. I guess it doesn't, it's just no, a... No, when, uh, when I first entered, and Mary, obviously together as one soul, enters the soul union state, once we started conceiving before then of what the soul union state would be, because we started having conceptions of it before you ever realise it, remember this is what faith is. Faith is when you can see something as a picture in your side of yourself, but, but you've not yet reached it yet, right? So we had faith at a certain point of time, and this was the early 1900s now, we had faith that we would actually enter this soul union state at some point in the future. And then we started conceiving of its possibilities. Because we realised that there was a high potential of a possibility of being able to what you call reincarnate, which I wouldn't really call it reincarnation, because it's actually a connection to another body on earth. Uh, from the soul union state and we had the ability to go through this process which nobody had ever gone through of course so we didn't know how S somebody had to do it first and uh, and that somebody was myself and so you know obviously I had 
the most fear-based experience about the entire process, which spent, I spent many, many years of my life dealing with. Um, but, but the beauty of, of it was that we started conceiving what it would be like to have the ability to reteach this stuff instead of being a spirit hovering around somebody trying to impress that person with truth which as you can see has its problems you know, you think of all the spirits that are with you trying to impress you with truth and you're going oh i've got no idea, I've got no idea. what's going on <laughs> and a lot of the times we're quite frustrated and we think we think they're not even there when they are there and all sorts of things happening so as a spirit, from that perspective, you're thinking, wow, if I could only be there again. Now, so that, that concept of being there again began very early in my progression, but I couldn't see how it could occur. I did present a message that you can actually read in the pageant messages where I theorised about how it could occur, but since nobody had reached the state, I didn't see that it could be possible. And what I talked about was the soul being in a union state in that message. So that message is present in the pageant messages if you wish to find it. Now, now, what happened was I talked about that, but at that point in time, of course, none of us had experienced it, so we couldn't, we couldn't say how it would occur. But we did often discuss what it would be like to return. And obviously many of us, and particularly the first seven pairs, had a really strong desire to be a part of that process. And so... Um, and that was all about love for, for humanity, but also not only love for humanity, but love for all of those spirits that are caught in the lower spheres of the spirit world. Because we could see the effect, in particular, the beauty of the mediumship with, with James Paget was we could see the effect he was having, in his, in his condition, was having on spirits in dark places, was often much more rapid than anything we could affect in the spirit world. So here we were in a bright condition, not being able to actually help many of the dark spirits effectively as James Paget himself could from the earth. And of course, you know, you know start, things start going through you, right? After you start seeing all of these different things. And obviously in 2000 years of existence, you see a lot of things. And so you start making, you know, feel it. You start having a lot of feelings about what that would be like, what it'd be like to return again and have this ability to be able to teach groups of people rather than, and not just a portion of the truth, but the whole truth and the effect that that could have, like having an audience like this of, of 200 people, let's say, at one with God on the earth, right? That, that has never happened in human history, right? And, and you, see, you saw the effects in the first century of one person being at one with God on earth for three and a half years. So you imagine like, 200 of us being at one with God on the earth for 10 years or 20 years. Like, you know, like the changes you can affect in, in such a state are remarkable, really. And then on top of that, if you consider also how when you draw a spirit to yourself when you're on earth, the spirit starts automatically connecting with many of his unhealed earth-based emotions, which means that you can very effectively get spirits to actually work through their emotional injuries as to why they're not progressing. And if you start looking at that, there are literally, there are more people in the hell, in hell of the spirit world, in the first sphere of the spirit world in dark locations, than there are on earth. Right? So if you start considering the power of that and how important that is in terms of progressing, having progression here happen on earth and in the spirit world, you start saying, start to understand why 14 people decide to be nuts enough to come back to it, to the place here, and, uh, and started to work their way through the potentiality of that emotionally. So of course, by the time we first entered the soul union state, myself and Mary, by then many, we had some very, very clear ideas of what we could achieve in that state potentially. And so when it came to acting out upon them, it was quite easy and, and clear. And of course, because when you're all in this state together or close to a similar state together, you're all making all these different ideas and putting together all these options and you know, all these different plans together and all those kind of things. So, so the first seven pairs who return all had very formulated plans of what, why we're returning, or what's going on. The difficulty we knew we would face is this difficulty that you are all facing, actually. And, 
and it's this. Um, that, that's, that is the most debilitating state that you can ever imagine, being in a state of fear. Many of us spend years and years and years in a state of fear when only one week of deep processing would release us from a problem or a trauma of our childhood or some other thing that's affecting us in our lives. I've seen people live in their fear for thousands of years. In that state, that terrified state of not moving, staying in stagnation, your fear is the most debilitating thing you can ever experience. Now, for the 14, their fear is immense because they've now lost all of this stuff, all of these beautiful things they once had and they experienced for a period of nearly 2,000 years, many, many of them, and now they're back on an earth where there is none of that available to them again. And the first nine months during gestation in the womb is the most traumatic period because in that state you can't even receive divine love unless your mother is. So if you can imagine 2,000 years receiving divine love, but having some connection with God, and then for nine months it was just like total blackout. And then not only that, if, you, if your mother isn't connected to the spirit world in any way or connected to other things in, in terms of related to soulmates, your soulmate can't give you love in the womb either in a reincarnation state. So if you imagine you've spent like, you know, like thousands or thousands of years together with your soulmate in a fairly pristine state and then a f fair few years in a soul union state and if you can Im imagine what it feels like to be wrenched apart and not only wrenched apart, but now you can't even feel her anymore or him anymore. So you can't feel God anymore. You can't feel your soulmate anymore. You imagine how much fear that's going to be present, particularly if your mother and father are in a state of fear. So that will give you some idea of why when ones of the 14 come up who are going through these things emotionally, they can barely speak to you because of the emotions that they're going through at the time. Does that make sense? And they find it so hard to even speak to you. And, and to be frank with you, if I hadn't had three or four years of emotion, look, I've actually started 13 years ago, 13 years ago processing my fear. Right? And if I hadn't had the first 10 years of that period dealing with my fears, I wouldn't be able to do, the, do it either. And you notice I still get emotional about a lot of this stuff, but it doesn't debilitate me as much anymore. But that's only because of the, all of the releasing that I've had to do surrounding the issues. So if you can bear that in mind, you, you will understand that there is a great difference between being in your first incarnation and being in a state where, and I don't even really like calling it reincarnation because that's not really what it is, but it is... But, but it looks like that, so, so let's call it, call it that for the sake of any name or term. When you're in a reincarnated state, it's a, it, the, one of the primary emotions, if you reincarnate into the planet on the earth at the moment, one of the primary emotions is just debilitating fear that would need to be processed every single time. So, so um, the 14 made that choice, obviously, you know, the seven soul pairs made that choice to come back. And uh, there are others who have returned since. Um, the seven have returned. Um, I've just been recently informed that there are three other pairs um, that have reincarnated since. But the difference between the seven who have returned and the three pairs that have reincarnated since is the seven who have returned have all had a life on earth, whereas the three who have returned, soul pairs that have returned since, had terminated lives on earth. So they either mis were miscarried, aborted, or um, died in childhood. And, uh, and so they, they're all, and they're all quite young now. The oldest of them is 11 or 12, and the youngest is uh, only just recently born. So, um, so for, the, for the seven who were first to return, obviously we have close bond and friendship, but many of them at the moment find it very, very difficult to actually acknowledge that, because to acknowledge that means acknowledging your identity. And one of the biggest issues that all of the 14 face is this psychological difficulty of coming to terms with your own identity 
and coming to terms with memories that you know you never experienced in this life and you know in the end are experiences from spirits. Does that make sense? Like, and as you've seen, when you get influences from spirits, you usually have pictures associated with those influences. You usually have voices or words or pictures as well as feelings, right? Um, when a person's reincarnated, you don't have words and you don't have the pictures, you just have the emotion. Because when you're in a soul union state, all you have and all you are actually is this pure ball of emotion. So, uh, so it, the pictures and the words come to you after you've allowed yourself to experience the emotion. So for many of the 14, what they're doing is they're really struggling to experience the emotion. Experiencing the emotion is like, it's like Jody uh, indicated earlier to you. It's like, no, like the only time you feel real is when you're feeling these emotions that are way, way left of field. <laughs> when I say way left of field, they feel totally nuts even to yourself. It feels totally crazy even to yourself to contemplate. And none of the 14 you'll notice have a desire to be one of the 14. Uh, none of them. Every one of them, including myself, have had deep resistance to being who, who I am. And, and of course, you can understand why, right? You know, you know, as soon as you start saying it, oh, let's talk about reincarnation. Like one, about one fifth of the world's religions believe in reincarnation. So if you start telling the truth about reincarnation, who are you going to upset? Uh, a good one fifth of the world's popula population. Now, now there's about one fifth of the world that's also Christian. So if you start saying you're Jesus, who are you going to upset? Uh, one fifth of the world. So now we're talking two fifths of the world population have major issues with you before you begin. <laughs> right? Now, not just major issues, but major violent type emotional issues with you. All right, so then you start talking about parents and how parents are actually responsible for creation of child, the child's emotions and conditions. Now, how many people are parents? <laughs> yeah, quite a lot, eh? It's like, <laughs> is it, should, should we say a good half of the world's population are parents? So, so, so that means now you've got 50% of people upset with you because what they want to hear is that, that it's because of some kind of tablet they took or, you know, some kind of, you know, gener gener some kind of inherent gen genetic problem, inherent inherited genetic problem that caused their problem and so they don't want to hear that it's all to do with the law of attraction and then you start telling the truth about death and you start talking about not just the fact that there is no such thing as death but there is this also uh, the truth and that is that actually many times we create our own death because of the unhealed emotions that we are actually not willing to address and deal with right so you start talking about that truth with people now Every single person who's ever had a loved one die doesn't want to hear that, do they? That their loved one in some way created their own death or that if we're parents with children dying, that it's something to do with our own creation in terms of emotional creation. And so now we've got like a fair portion of the world's population upset with you. Can you see why the world has been so resistive to truth? Because we've got all of these emotional hooks and baggages about not wanting the truth. No, we don't want to hear it, right? So, so you imagine now you're up in the spirit world for a moment. There's 14 of you before you entered the soul union state. And you're looking at all these things going on. And you realize that potentially you've got the ability to start correcting some of these things if you decide to return again. How many of you wouldn't have made that choice? <laughs> yeah? Most of you, a lot of you would have, wouldn't you? Have made the choice to return if you had the ability to, knowing those truths. So, so that's why that choice was made by the group. But that group was very close, obviously. We're all very close to each other and I still feel very close to all of them. But very few of them at the moment feel very close to myself uh, for a lot of emotional reasons, which you can understand, really. Just being in my company forces them to consider why do they feel the way they feel about me. My own daughter, I remember the first time I met my daughter this life. And uh, she'd been talking to Luke for some time and she'd been having long conversations with Luke. She felt Luke was her soulmate and they've, they've been trying to develop a relationship. And she said to him, like, I don't even want to see AJ. I don't even want to see him. 
And anyway, one time I decided I, I did an excursion to Canada from the US, right? And, uh, and I decided I wanted to see them. And she decided in her own heart that she was going to try to reject me as soon as she met me. And, try, you know, because, and she decided that I would be some old uh, tubby, um, she had a lot of lists of what she wanted me to be so that she could reject me, right? Anyway, um, I, I meet her and give her a hug and f she doesn't know why, but she just cries. She just bursts out crying, just cries, can't control herself crying. She spent the next three hours crying just from our meeting each other. Now that feels quite strange if you think about it. You've never met this person your entire life, you think, and you're bawling your eyes out with them. Why? Or oh, what's going on? Like, and see, she then starts, and I'm there holding, holding her while she's crying, and she starts telling me her entire life, <laughs> right, crying all the way through. And there's Luke pacing back and forth, pacing back and forth, <laughs> pacing back and forth, right, while she's doing all of this. And she's saying, I don't know why I'm telling you all of this, but I feel like I have to tell you. And she, you know, she's just going through all these emotions, right? And, uh, and like I knew what was happening, but she obviously didn't at the time even know what was happening. And she'd been like wanting to have nothing to do with me for a long time. Now over the next few years, she decided to have a little bit to do with me. And uh, we spent some time together along with Luke and, and, and others of the 14. But what happened was sooner or later with all, of, well, with all people, and you'll notice this too, sooner or later you'll notice that I'll say something that's really confronting. And usually it's sooner rather than later, right? <laughs> and, uh, and so what happens is I, I, I say something that's confronting, it's based on truth, I still have a feeling of love for the person while I'm saying it. But all of a sudden there's an emotion within them as a response. Now in that place, your response to what is being triggered in you is very important. For the majority of people, what they do is they just step away from the truth and get angry with the deliverer, the person who delivered the truth, the messenger, if you like, of the truth. And so uh, one of the things that I've uh, found quite difficult is I've come from a, from a world in the spirit world where for nearly 2,000 years people listened to the truth <laughs> to a place on earth where even my own daughter can't hear the truth. Right. And of course, there's a lot of emotions for me <laughs> that brought up, you know. And so what's happened uh, with a lot of the 14 is they hear the truth for a period of time. Sooner or later, we trigger a truth that's really, really a core part of their emotional condition at the moment. And sooner or later, generally, most people run away from it. And by the way, there's been far more people who haven't been one of the 14 that have run away from it than, than you know, 14 people. But... The truth is that every time we get confronted, we have a choice. And many of us make a choice to be in anger or rage rather than be in a state of openness and vulnerability. And unfortunately, that choice is what locks us up. You see, that's a choice based on <coughs> fear. The choice that we often make is a choice based on fear. So with all of the 14 now, there is a lot of fear present in them. And, and of course, talking to me is one of the biggest problems that they face. Does that make sense? Because talking to me is a reminder of where they came from. And they don't want to remember where they came from most of the time. And they certainly don't want to go through the, what they know to be the truth. And that is that there are going to be the majority of people on this planet in a state of rage with them for a period of time. Right? That's the truth. Because, you know, sooner or later they start owning up to this 14, they start owning up, oh, there's no reincarnation as, you've, uh, as you believe, there goes another one-fifth. Oh, what about the parent thing? There goes another half. There, what about the Christian thing? There goes another one-fifth of the population in rage with you personally. Not, not, it's not generalised anymore. It's not like, you know, oh, they're just angry people. It's, no, they're angry with you. <laughs> and they're not angry with your mum and your sister or your brother that are angry with you, specifically you. Now, of course, you're there, you imagine just sitting there contemplating that. You're sitting down, imagine for the first moment in your life, you've lived for 30, 40 years, let's say. All of the, by the way, all the 14 have lived at least 22 years to 
my age, which is 47. So they're in that age bracket. So you imagine you're just sitting down for the very first moment and you're starting to get hit with all these emotions about you having had an existence in the first century, from, for the majority of them, an existence in the first century where you remember all of these events starting to come up as emotions. They're coming up as emotions. I've been raped, I've been tortured, I've been killed, I've been this, I've been... All of these emotions start coming up inside of you, right? Then on, on top of that, you're now contemplating, if you go ahead and actually feel these emotions, what is the rest of the world going to think of you? What is the rest of the world going to do with you? Right? You're going to confront every religion on the planet in some way. There's not one religion on the planet that's in a state of complete harmony with truth. Now, many of them have truth in them. And of course, that's the nature of the beast here in, on the earth. Many of us have portions of the truth in us. But there is no one religion in a complete state of truth. There is no one group of people who understand God in, at almost any level that you can understand God in the celestial sphere state. There's no one political party on this planet who is able to act in harmony with love. There is no one nation that actually is able to act in harmony with love. Now you start adding all that together. So I'm going to, here I am sitting contemplating all of this, and I'm going to have to contemplate that every single nation on this planet is going to be upset with me. At some point, I'm going to criticise, not by being critical, but by actually stating the truth about what is happening. I am going to, in their reception, in their mind, criticise their nation. You see what people, have, what people do when you criticise their nation? Well, no, 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 hang on a sec. Don't you go blaming the Muslims. Honestly, what do you do when people start criticising Australia? How do you feel inside of yourself? Oh, that's not fair. It's not, you know, we've got a nice country. What about your crappy country? No, no, no. And, we start, <laughs> and you start getting all of these, like, attachments and emotions. And then let somebody, somebody criticise your race. Right? So let's say I start criticising Caucasians. You know, a whole bunch of mongrels you are. You know, you don't love the blacks and you don't care about the... Asians and you know you think you're the you know you go and conquer nations one after the other and there's all this stuff historically which by the way I could call upon if I wanted to criticize one 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 group of people right now if you just state the truth to that group of people already they feel it as a criticism because there are emotions in them about that does that make sense and as those emotions rise, then everyone starts responding. Now you're there, imagine yourself sitting there realising that I'm having all these realisations of truth, that I've got to teach this and I've got to teach, I just feel that inside of me, these are all truths. And then you're contemplating, wow, like every single person on this planet is going to finish up at some point having a personal vendetta with you. And to be frank with you, many of you have already experienced that with me where you've been in a rage personally with me. And do, don't, you, do you think I don't feel it? Of course I feel it. Does that make sense? Now, imagine you're sitting down and you're so afraid of everything. And then on top of that, you just come to this realisation that not only will there be personal people upset with you individually, but there are whole, going to be whole groups of people who are upset with you just because of the truth that you're saying. Whole groups of people. And, it's, and now you're weighing up, do I really want to be one of the 14? Or, you know, what, what would most of us decide under those circumstances? What you do is to deny your identity for as long as you possibly can, <laughs> and if, if at all, ever mention it. So I contemplated that for a long time. That's what I did. So I denied my identity for a long time. Don't want to mention it. No. You know, get up in front of a group of people and, and start talking about the truth. How do you know this? Uh, you know, like, well, you know, I feel it. And I, you know, I, I try to bypass the answer constantly. No, well, I'm sorry. Well, let's just stuff it. Right, I'm just going to tell you the truth. The truth is that actually I've experienced it all because, and, who, uh, you know, and I'm Jesus. Sorry about that. Like, that's how it feels. <laughs> like, um, that's how it feels to me. Like, sorry about that. I know it's a hard, hard thing to swallow. But, but 
but it's the truth. But I can't do anything about that truth in the sense that all I can do is either embrace the truth or reject the truth. And every one of the 14 faces this particular dilemma. The dilemma is, do they embrace the truth of their own life and in the consequence of that, get rejected by almost everyone in their life, not just, per, not just everyone personally, like family, friends and all that, but also everyone in terms of nations eventually and, and religions, and do they contemplate that or do they just try to avoid it? Can you see why a lot of them want to avoid it? <laughs> and that's why when Mary and Corny and Jody get us up in front of you, there's all this fear, there's all this emotion playing, there's all these memories going on, which they themselves are struggling by themselves to actually come to terms with from a psychological perspective, let alone tell you as a group of mistrusting uh, like people who feel that, like, how can I believe this, rather than, and tell you that. And many of you have heard this for years from me now, and still you know that it's not resolved in you as to whether it's true or not even. Right? And, and don't you think the 14 feel that? Of course they feel that. They feel that lack of resolution, therefore they feel that every time they get in front of, uh, in front of you, there is this projection going, you know, can I come back of, oh, I don't know if I can believe that, oh, I don't know if I, this all sounds pretty flaky to me. Like, and, and that's the feeling that they get from you. And mind you, if I grabbed you, any one of you, and put you up here, and you started telling us about your life, and then everyone in the audience says, oh, I don't believe that happened to you. Oh, no, I don't believe that is what went on for you. No, you, you know, this is all just something that you just want to manufacture just to sound good and all those kind of... And you, if we as an audience projected that at another person up here, what would the person finish up doing most of the time? They'd just go, oh, you know, don't, you know I, I won't say anything. And this is why many of the 14 don't want to say things to you because many of us still have a lot of judgment about what they're saying. If you could open your heart a bit and at least contemplate the possibility of what they're saying as truth, you may finish not only learning a lot about our lives in the first century, our lives in the spirit world, which by the way, is a life you will eventually experience. So wouldn't it be great to find out a bit about it? And then, and then on top of that, learn a lot about how to process your emotions because through their example in terms of what they do and how they're expressing themselves. So there's a lot of opportunities. And I am constantly surprised of how little I am questioned and how most of the time I am treated condescendingly about the issue of whether I'm Jesus or not. I'm totally surprised. Like if it was me in the audience and I was, and one of you, let's say Peter got up and said, oh, I'm Jesus, I'd be going, mm, okay, well, I'd like to ask this guy a lot of questions about that. Right? What, what about this? What about that? What about this? How did you come to that clue? You know, all these different things. Now, now, some people have asked me questions, but the questions have all been coming from the point of view of how can I disprove it to him that he is who he says he's saying? <laughs> do, do you think that if I get up in front of 200 people and say who I am, that I'm going to actually be easily swayed? Oh, really? Do you think I'm going to be easily swayed? Don't you think I would have had to work through lots of emotions even to get into a place where I could speak to you openly about it if you consider these groups of emotions? Now, what about others of the 14 that get up there? Oh, you know, they sound real flaky or whatever is maybe the projection we have. Like sometimes on the net, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, AJ just manipulated you. Well, they know that I haven't manipulated them, right? But that's what they say. You know, all these people say. Now, do you want, as if, would you in that situation want to tell the people the truth when you're already getting that from them? What would you feel? Like, of course you wouldn't, would you? Like, you, you just go, well, fair enough, if you want to believe that, I can still work through my stuff without this, d doing this torturous thing <laughs> of being in front of a group of people. So, so the truth is that if we could allow ourselves to be open and allow ourselves to understand that actually it's not, a, it's not as easy a process as what you may first have been led to believe about reincarnation, right? And you may open up to the possibility that, yes, the 14 have emotions in them because of a whole certain group of circumstances and situations, and you can start to understand what those circumstances and situations might be. You may finish up learning a lot through the process just by questioning. Many of you are mediumistic. If you're just open to it 
you may learn a lot about what's going on, about you know, whole, the whole reincarnation thing if you wanted to. But many of us are shut down about it. We can't contemplate that. We feel it's one of the hard things to contemplate about coming and listening to AJ. And so what we do is we shut down. We shut down all of that stuff emotionally. Does that make sense? Carol, you want to ask? It's just... AJ, do you still have any presence in the spirit world? Like in the pageant messages, they, you know, you're sort of pretty interactive there. Do you, in your sleep state, do you have any presence there? Do you go back to um, those spheres? Um, there is a bit of a misinformation that I want to clear up first. First thing is, right as I'm speaking to you, I am also speaking to hundreds of thousands of other people right now. All right. Now, that being the case, right, what you're seeing of me now is only just a very small fragment of me. Do, do you understand that? Like, so you still have energy there? What, what, happen, what, it, what the truth is, and, and by the way, some people have started channeling about a bit of this stuff. I think, James, you've channeled a bit of information about this now. Um, maybe I can just describe it a little in a little, little bit more detail to you. Um, but my, on the website, James, I've posted some of James's channelings, which you could read through and, and you'll understand some of this. If you could think of myself and Mary, we are one being, right? So that's our soul. Our soul exists in the 22nd sphere condition, in, this, in the soul union state. Does that make sense? Um, and that is right now, our soul exists in that state, right? And that soul is totally able to communicate and, and, and do all of the things that we've been doing all the last so many thousands of years that we've been alive in that state. Now, the problem that we have, though, from, in terms of your belief system or anybody's belief system, is when we reincarnated, what happened was that there were two bodies created, okay, just the same as there were two bodies created when you incarnated. Uh, just draw my girl. She's a lot sexier than that, but anyway. <laughs> and uh, now, those two bodies are our physical body, spirit body, physical body, spirit body, right? So, so they are the two bodies that were created at the time of conception. And what happened was, if we, as a soul, connected to those bodies in that soul condition, we would have instantly destroyed those bodies and destroyed the parent holding them. Right. So in other words, our own mothers would have died in the process. Right? If we establish a complete, let's, let's draw a complete connection like this. So if I draw it a big, and that's the connection, if you can think of it. So if I did that to those bodies, like my, if my soul, our soul, I should be saying, myself and Mary in the soul union state, if I did that to our bodies, any one of our bodies, we're instantly dead. Right? because there's just so much energy that those bodies can't cope with because of the emotional condition of our parents and the, the situation here on earth and lots of other reasons. So what we've had to do instead is do this. We've had to create a connection right at the beginning. We created a little tiny connection to those bodies. Does that make sense? So we've got this little tiny connection that's in those bodies. And the only way now that we can grow that connection is for these bodies to make some choices about removing emotions. Right? Now, the main problem the 14 face is the intellect of the spirit body's brain. That's our main problem. Our main problem is that that starts developing with a certain persona, with a certain psychological profile. The psychological profile is the profile that works created is by the process of being born. So, so what's happening is that we're, we're reborn, if you like, through this process. These are new bodies. It's a totally different body than I had in the first century. Totally different. Right? And, and in, in fact, it's immaterial what body I have. But I chose the parents to experience the whole group of emotions. And then it's the brain of my spirit body that is very resistive because it's learned through the process of growth who I am. And who I am is not that. I am not that. By the way, this is very similar to you, right? You've also been very disconnected from your soul. But if you can think of your soul when you first begin, it's like a little soul. Does that make sense? 
and when it separate and when it does its separation process into the bodies, what, what it's doing is that it it doesn't have these huge emotions. It only has right right at the beginning. It has a dribble of emotions because that's how God created us. That our soul grows with our bodies in the first incarnation. So what's happening in the first incarnation? And by the way, this happened in my first incarnation. Is that I had this tiny little soul which got split into two, and I went through this same process of growth that you're going through now, right? Exactly the same process. So we're no different to each other, right? We're just at different stages of it. I've been around 2,000 years, that's all. And so there's different stages of it. And it's not the 2,000 years that matters. It's how you receive divine love that matters as to its growth. So you begin like that as a standard human soul, and then as you grow into this place, you're growing into that. Now, this one's fine connecting with those bodies. It has no trouble. You, 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 know, you don't have usually any trouble. When I say no trouble, that's probably not true because you have miscarriages occur, which are troubles occurring between the connection. But all the troubles that occur are the results of the parent's emotions right? that go on for in, the, in, in the first incarnation. In the reincarnation process, this soul is able to overcome the parents' emotions and maintain a connection with the bodies. But how much of a connection with those bodies it can maintain is very dependent upon what it's going to affect around the people. So obviously in the womb, there's only a very, very slight connection that can be maintained. And then as you grow, if the intellect takes over, it's very, very difficult to establish a connection with those bodies. But as soon as that start, you start to make a choice in your brain, if you're reincarnated, to deal with the emotions that you feel that are out of harmony with love, now you will start getting a flood of memories through a conduit, right? If you could think of it like that. So you get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger portions of your own soul being reflected through you. Now, you've seen my own growth in two years, many of you. So you can see different portions of my soul starting to be reflected that you weren't seeing before. Does that make sense? Now, that's going to continue to go until such a point in time that many of you won't even recognise me again. Does that make sense to you? Like, you'll see portions of my personality like I am now in this new me that's slowly being created, right? But there'll be other parts of me that you think, well, I, don't, I didn't ever see that coming, right? And this is what will happen. And eventually the conduit between our soul, Mary and my in the soul union state, gets bigger and bigger and bigger based on how much emotional energy can flow through that conduit between my body and my soul. When I get into an awamah state and when Mary gets into an awamah state, obviously that will have an acceleration effect on that process. Does that make sense to you? And eventually we will have total control again over these two bodies. Right? Total control over what's going on with them eventually. Which means that I'll be able to not only remember everything that I can remember now about my life in the first century, and I'll not only be able to remember about my spirit life and a lot of the things about my spirit life, none of which I've discussed with you because most of you haven't ever asked the questions about it, and I don't even blame you for not being interested after all. It is my life and you have your own life to worry about, right? But on top of that, there's a heap of things we remember about like science, for example. Like how to manipulate energy, how to manipulate matter, all of those things. Right? So there's all those things that will start flowing through from our soul. And then, then there's more and more and more of those kind of things that start flowing. And remem memories about God that we're yet to have will flow through. And we'll be able to explain to you in a lot more detail about what it feels like to be connected with God in that one minute state once we reach that state ourselves, like, again. And all those memories will come. And at the moment, the only thing blocking our memories, and this is something that I've tried to indicate to all of the 14 with various varying success, <laughs> The only thing blocking our memories is our emotional condition to cope with the memory. Does that make sense? And you know what it's like to go through overwhelming emotions. Many of you have started doing that, right? Where you've felt totally overwhelmed, like you just can't expand anymore in this process. It just feels like you're getting pumped full of stuff, right, from a, from a feeling perspective. Well, you'll get to a point where you can cope with that memory. 
or that emotion, because every memory is emotional, you will cope with that emotion. You'll be able to cope with that and then your soul will expand a bit more and you'll be able to cope with more and your soul will expand a bit more and you'll be able to cope with more. It's the same kind of process. For the, for the 14, it's just a bit differently in, implemented because of the process of reincarnation. Right. So what you're getting at the moment in, when you look at me is a, is a subset of who I truly am. And what you get at Mary, when you look at Mary, is a subset of who she truly is. The subset is limited by our fear. And our fear dominates. If our fear dominates, then of course the amount of things that we can recall um, are limited. As my fear gets released, I can recall more. As I emotionally process and release more and more of those memories, I can get to a stage where I can recall everything to you. And I, I'm looking forward to that time uh, myself. Like many of the others of the 14 are in total fear about that time. Does that make sense? So myself now, I've worked through lots of different emotions and feelings and experiences now that now I'm actually looking forward to being myself, even though many of you will find that you're even more confronted than you are now about what I have to say. And I won't have this deep fear that I had a lot of my life of having to please anybody or having to say things that make you feel comfortable. Does that make sense? Because I've released all of those emotions and I'm free now. Does that make sense? It takes a little while to warm up. This, you've got to wait four seconds, Carol. You're not patient enough. Um, okay, so to continue on from that question, is this the, did you teach in the spirit world in this sort of manner? You know, of like, course. Yeah. We, we are, you are right now, Carol, teaching in the spirit world in this manner. Right. <laughs> many of you are already doing this. You're not aware in your sleep state that you are, but yes, many of you are already doing that yourselves. Yes, we do teach in this manner. One of my roles, which is very, very different to who I am as a person, one of my roles is obviously is to teach the truth as much as I possibly can because it's my passion as well. It's also one of the roles that our soul has as, a, as that's one of our desires, our passionate desires. And you have the same passionate desire. You are right now, many of you, teaching in the spirit. Many of you even have told me that you have had memories of doing that, haven't you? Yep. So what's the rest of the question, Carol? Uh, that was the rest of the question. <laughs> <laughs> no <worries>. Thank you. <laughs> Can we go to Tim? Okay. Uh, um, I've, I've had um, times uh, like midweek where I'll just um, be contemplating things and the thought of you and Mary will come into my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and I sort of always have this feeling of, I wonder how they are. And um, it's almost... The only way I can, which the question I was going to ask is, are we communicating in that state? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, what I just get from you is like a feeling of a smile and all this love, and then I laugh, and that's yeah. <laughs> what goes on. But yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. The truth is that your soul has the capacity to communicate instantaneously to billions of other souls at any one point in time. Now that capacity needs to be developed and grow, obviously, and so we all have that potential capacity. And, and as you develop and receive divine love, that capacity automatically improves. When you get to the state of a soul union state, you have that capacity with, with millions of people at the same time. Billions of people, in fact, at the same time, through feelings. Many people have already had, uh, many who are mediumistic have had pictures of me where a person's talking about the truth to another group of persons, say down at, you know, well, one occasion I remember now is down at Wagga, I was up at Wilkesdale and she has a, had a medium told her that I was standing behind her as she was speaking and yet I was also in my current state speaking to another group of people right, at the same time. So all of those things are all possible right? and all of your souls are possible of this, possible. You just need to expand that limited mind that we have that dominates us and, and causes us to think that I am this being, this, this flesh and blood, that's who I am. As soon as we start expanding that, we start, and, and it's only through the reception of divine love that our soul really expands anyway. But as we start expanding that, we start realising these things and start having, you come to a conscious awareness of them. So, so while I've been consciously aware of that for some time, I also have a complete blackout when I go into my sleep state. So what happens for me is I go to sleep, 
and seven or eight hours later I wake up and I can't remember a single thing. Now, um, I once asked some spirit friends about why that was happening and they said, because you don't want to remember. <laughs> and now I'm starting to appreciate how much I don't want to remember because the contrast between what's happening for me in the spirit world and what's happening for me on earth is so great that I'd be in constant grief at the moment if I allowed myself to think about it. So a lot of times I'm still shutting myself down from thinking and contemplating about the difference in the two states. Does that make sense? And so, yeah. But the, the truth is, yes, that many of you have experienced that already with me, with Mary, and with others of the 14, where you've actually experienced them being with you at different times. So, and that will continue to happen. Um, can I go to Joy and then cross to here? So, yeah. so Joy first and then Dan. Give me a hand up. Just so keep your hand up so that he can give you the mic. Yeah. Is it on? Yes, it is. Um, AJ, if I'm up teaching in the spirit world, mm -hmm. am I teaching from the same limited knowledge that I have of divine truth here? No. Um, the reason why is because already in the spirit world, in your sleep state, you know things that you don't know for certain here. So, so many of you are still, even though you won't admit it to myself, myself or yourselves, many of you are still very afraid of death here. In your sleep state, you're not afraid of death at all. Can you see how being afraid of death would inhibit you from teaching something down here compared to teaching something in the spirit world? Like, down in the spirit world, you know your condition. You know, also, you have some confidence in the fact that truth and how it protects you. Does that make sense in the spirit world? Here on earth, how many of you are petrified about confronting the truth with your family, your friends, your neighbours? You know, most of us really still, right? And so, so in the end, of course, your state in the spirit world in terms of what you have the capacity to teach is much greater than what you have the capacity to teach here unless you work through those emotions. Now, now we have very deep re emotional resistances to even remembering the spirit world state. Now, to give you an example of that, if I know in the spirit world there is no such thing as death, and I know in the spirit world that I don't need to be afraid of my family, my friends, my, my you know, any of my workmates or anything like that in terms of telling the truth and I know that in the spirit world, can you see how much resistance I'd have emotionally to that in this awake state? Because if I go up and say to my family, oh, I actually, you know, this is what I believe, this is, how I feel, this is how I feel now, most of them would think you're totally nuts, right? And then you'll get lots of attack, you know, attract lots of attack and so forth because anybody in truth certainly does attract attack. And so, so what happens is that we get attacked and what are we afraid of? Being attacked. And we don't want to deal with that emotionally. So what we do instead is we say, I just don't want to remember what I know in the spirit world. I don't want to remember last night even in the spirit world because if I remember last night, I might want to act upon it today. And I don't want to act upon it today because I'm so petrified, I'm so afraid that if I act upon it today, things will change so much in my life and I'll be attacked and I'll be, you know, hurt and so forth. And so what we finish up doing is separating the two lives so much that we can't remember most of our sleep state. So how can we be more open to that? By acting in truth and without fear every day while you're awake. The more you deal with your fears here in the awake state, the more you'll be able to remember in your sleep state. It's only your fear that prevents any memories from occurring. Remember I said that at the beginning? What's, what's preventing that for the 14? Fear. What's preventing it for you? Fear. It's just the same thing preventing it for all of us. Just fear is present, pre presenting us from knowing, preventing us from knowing the truth about what we actually do eight hours of our lives every day. That's the only thing that's pre presented. <laughs> preventing, <laughs> preventing us. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, if we... um, hi, AJ. Um, I just wanted to admit that it's a lot more comfortable sitting here listening to you than actually asking a question. And I've contemplated asking a question for a long time as you're talking. Um, you triggered me off a little bit when you said that none of us were interested, um, which has brought me to ask this question. When I say something like that, let me clarify. Um, none of you are interested enough to get over your fear. 
That's it. Yeah, it's the fear that keeps it's me the here. Fear that you, you that my heart is racing, my palms are sweating, <laughs> and I can't even remember the full question because it was so long ago. Yeah. But um, I'm wondering how it can change for you and the 14 um, when you say that you have so many people against you, like with your the one fifth of the Christian and the one fifth of whoever <laughs> yeah, else that yeah. was, and the half of the whatever. Like, are they your emotions you need to deal with? Um, or our, our acceptance of you, is that also going to help? Like, how can, you know, half of the world... Um, am I making well, sense? Well, firstly, <laughs> let's make it clear, nobody has to accept me. Nobody has to no, accept me. I'm wondering how so, um, things can change for you. Um, like, for, secondly, for the 14. part of your question is, demonstrated from an, is coming from an emotion that you want to protect me in some way, and you don't need to. So let's address that, and you forget about doing that, because you don't need to protect me in any way, all right? But how can you help the situation on the planet is really a good question to ask yourself. The truth is that the best way to help is obviously the issue that we face on this planet is here's the divine truth, right? And the divine truth needs to get onto the earth. Now, it doesn't get onto the earth with words. Do you understand that yet? Do you, you, you see that it doesn't get onto the earth with words? Because you can speak all you want, and unless you're acting in harmony with what you're talking about, it's not going to have any power. At all. So that's first. So what I need to do myself personally, if I want to help the situation, is I need to bring myself into harmony as much as I possibly can with what the divine truth is that I know. And by the way, if you do that, emotions will be triggered automatically inside of you. Now... You don't need to protect me in any way. Because the truth is, even if I'm the only person on the planet with divine truth in my soul, God and me have a great connection. Does that make sense? And nobody else, and this is where all of us at some point also need to get to this place where we're not addicted to what we're getting from other people anymore because God and you have this going on where you're not worried anymore and you don't have this fear anymore of what, you know, what people are going to say, how they're going to treat you, what they're going to do to you, how they're going to harm your life, who's going to leave you, whether your family, friends and other people are going to leave you or any of those kind of things. Because you and God are like this and that's all you need in the end. That's all you need. You don't even need that with your soulmate to be happy, right? And just have that with God and you can be happy for the rest of your life on earth. So that, bearing that in mind... All we need to do is start focusing on that ourselves. That's how we help the situation here on the planet. When so if I, we all lived in peace and harmony, had no fear, that's the answer. Yep. If I can live in fearless place with regard to divine truth, and you can live in a fearless place with regard to divine truth, and everyone in the audience can live in the same fearless place with regard to divine truth, what do you think that's going to do to everything around you? Things can change then. Does that make sense? Now that doesn't mean though that all of a sudden one third of the world's religions are not going to be upset with me saying that I'm Jesus. Do you follow me? So that won't change? Well, it will but change your over perception time. perception towards it would. It will change. That, that may change over time. Like in the first century when I began speaking in a public manner like I'm doing with yourself now, um, in the first century there was a lot of resistance, of course. Like I'd, I'd say to a group of people, hi, um, not quite like this, of course, but I'd say, hi, not in my Australian accent either, but um, I would say, hi, I'm the Messiah. Of course, um, I used to say it a bit more long-winded than that, because that's... <laughs> Basically, I would, read, I would read one of the prophets, and then, I was, then I'd say, now, that day has come. You're, you're, now, you're now interacting with me, the person that was prophesied in that in that book of the Bible. Now, first response. Uh, when I did this in my hometown, which was the first town that I did it in, was I decided I needed to confront <laughs> all the people who knew me from the time I was 13 years of age onwards with this truth. And so I went to my hometown, Nazareth, and I confronted everybody with this in the synagogue. You were already at one with God then, though. Oh, I was at one with so God. So now you're in a different circumstance. Totally, yeah. totally different. It's a lot harder to do when you're not in an at one state, let me assure you. So I went there and did, did that, and they wanted to throw me over the cliff that was near the synagogue. 
and they grabbed me to throw me over the cliff and the only people that stopped me was my father, uh, stopped them from doing it was my father and mother. They said, look, he's gone completely balmy, so why don't you just ignore what he's saying? That's what they said. And there were many times in my life where my mother and father in the first century, um, unlike what you hear nowadays, thought I was completely balmy. Yeah. Just like many of you nowadays do <laughs> as well, right? And so, so what I had to do is like, I'm going to live in divine truth no matter what the consequence is. Now, of course, when you're at one with God, that's a lot easier than when you aren't. Right? Now, I started saying I was the Messiah when I was not in an at one state with God. My first time I ever talked about it was when I was 20 with my father. Right? Now, he already thought I was anyway, right? so that made it a little easier, although his concept of the Messiah compared to what mine were were vastly different. You know, his concept was I'd be this warmongering prince of warfare that would come along and lead the Jews to freedom from the Romans and, and I'd be a king. Like that was his concept. My concept would I'd be this humble... Uh, person who would never pick up a sword or fight anybody and who would lead people into love of the Roman Empire. <laughs> very, very different like, um, concepts. And so, of course, my father had a lot of problem with the concept that I had. And I had to stay in truth with him. And then I had to stay in truth with my mother and in truth with my brothers and sisters and in truth with my friends. And eventually it got so hard to do that that I had to leave my hometown of Nazareth and move to Capernaum where I lived alone for nine years, right? basically. I lived five of those in a cave, but the other four alone in Capernaum because I had to actually still deal with all of those breakage. You know, you have to break all of these relationships to get them into the right one. So at the moment, many of us have this kind of thing. Here's Bas. Here's our parents, our mum and our dad, you know, and our brothers and sisters and so forth. And we have really, a lot of times, codependent, addictive relationships with them, right? And, and they're very hooked into those. They're very hooked into those. Now, as soon as I start recognising it within myself, what do I start doing? I go, OK, I've got this codependent, addictive relationship with mum. So what I've got to do is sort my way through that emotionally. So I start sorting a way through it. And part of that is mum starts feeling a change in me towards her. Can you see that? So she's feeling a change in me towards her and then what is she starting to do? Well, she's starting to stress out now because her codependence and her addictions of her son feeling a certain way towards her are now being broken. Right? Now she has two choices. She could go say, go with it, son. I really appreciate what you're doing. It's going to free up our relationship. Do you think many of them do that? Uh, of course not. So what they do instead is they start, you know, lots of aggro, lots of upset. Everything starts coming our way, right? What we need to do is still stay in this place of truth throughout that entire process. Right? And as you come out of that, out of the other end, what you'll find will happen is you'll, have so, you'll feel so free that you can be yourself with every single person person on the planet no matter what they feel about you what they say about you so that means the third of people who are upset because you're saying jesus on earth now and they're saying no he's not right and you think that aj is what nutcase you must be right so they 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 will actually be confronted still but you will no longer feel an emotion about it you will no longer feel afraid about it once you deal with that particular truth does that make sense inside of yourself you release it inside of yourself. Can we go up to uh, I actually have a bit more of a question. Oh, okay. If one that's more. all right. Um, just going back to that other one about the, um, I can't remember how you started it before, but you were saying that we won't recognise you because this is only one part that we're seeing of you. The truth is really you won't even recognise you, let alone me. tree <laughs> to know, <laughs> I don't know myself now, um, <laughs> in all honesty. Yeah. Um, no, I was just wondering like, what other parts that you were saying, like God and your soul, that you're going to bring back from the 22nd sphere that you're... Um, Myself and Mary <laughs> will be able to be ourselves once we release our fear as to why we're not being ourselves now. Do you, do you follow that? Now, when we're ourselves, all of the knowledge that we've gathered over 2,000 years of progression is available to anybody who speaks to us and also to ourselves. Does that make sense? I'm just a bit confused as to um, the rest of yourselves. Like, what does that mean? Like, mm, no fear, no whatever. Like, you have special powers. Like, 
Well, the soul um, in a 20 seconds fear state, yes, has special powers. When you say special, every single person is ever going to reach that place, they're all going energy, to have the like same. You said before. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the truth is, yes, when you're in that state, you do have special abilities and special knowledge and special powers, of which all of us can get to that state. So, so there's, no, you know, there's no separation of us in that regard. It's just that that will be available to you for the first time on the planet that it's ever been available to you before. Like, you know, like I know for myself, if I was in my first century incarnation, not, not this one that I'm in now, but my first century one, and some guy come along and he had this, ex this 20 seconds for your union state. Mate, I'd be giving up most of the things that, I, that I'm doing and I'd just be focusing on what can I can learn from this chap. That's what I'd be doing myself. And I'm, I'd be doing that because I'm humble enough to do that. And the question is, are we humble enough to do that? You know, that's the question. So at the end of the day, if I met somebody who I knew was in that state and they started demonstrating that state through the love they have in their own soul, right? And I started seeing the picture of everything coming together and everything starting to be, you know, starting to gel, I would be very, very, very tempted to follow <laughs> what they're suggesting to do for myself so I could get into the same state. Now, the beauty of doing that is that you can decide, no, nah, no, nah, this is a heap of crap. Right, I'm going to not do this, right? This is a heap of crap and this is okay. You're allowed to decide that. That's okay, right? I'm not saying it's not okay. I'm just saying this is an opportunity. Now, there's been many people in the past who've, who've, who've longed for me to come and visit them in the spirit world. One day soon, we'll start talking with some of those people and you'll start me meeting them. And I go and appear to them and because I'm not as good as what they thought I would be, because right? they had some concept of me being God or me being... Or is that an emotion within you still? Well, no, it's just a fact. They just didn't believe that I was who I was saying I was. In fact, you can read this in the pageant messages, can you not? Who's read the pageant messages where they've seen the messages that, that I'd go to somebody and they say, oh, I don't believe he's Jesus? Yeah, there's plenty of times it's happened to me in the past, right? So it's not just me and my emotions saying this to you. It Sorry, is I didn't the, mean to be rude. That's right. There's, it's the truth. The truth is that many of, many of you at some point in the future will go, jeez, uh, maybe he is Jesus. And then after that comes, jeez, he is Jesus. <laughs> like, like, you know, there's, a, there's that sort of realisation that will come at some point too. And it's not important who I am, but what, what's important is there's a heap of truth that the realisation prevents you from knowing. Do, do you understand? Like it prevents you from practicing. So, so if, I, if I have somebody come up to me and, say, and he says, look, I know the secrets of the universe. And I go, oh, yeah, sure, mate. Sure you do. Right? Now, straight away, I've got a barrier, haven't I, with that person? Can you see that? I'm going, yeah, it's like condescension. Is my, sure you do. You know, come on, out with some of these truths and we'll see whether they're truths or not. And then he tells me one or two things that just go, what, what, what? No, I, I don't get it that way, you know, like at all. And then, then what am I doing? I've got this condescension towards the person and I don't want to hear it. So all of a sudden, I am, I am just blocked, really, aren't I, towards being open to what the person's saying and also practising it to just experiment with it. So I'm not saying to you, you've got to follow what I'm teaching at all, but I am saying if you experiment with it, you may find that what I'm saying is true. And then as you find that, you can then build on that with faith. You see, most of us don't do that, though. What we do instead is we say, no, no, that's totally different to my concept of truth. That's totally different to how I see things. No, I can't believe that can be true. This is what we do. Right at the start, we do this. Just like historically, thousands of scientists have done it at the start of any investigation. You know, one scientist says, oh, there's a thing such as cold fusion. And the whole scientific community go, oh, what stupid idiots. How can that be the case? Energy transfer. And they come up with all these reasons based on their own experience of why cold fusion can't be a reality, right? So they're already blocked towards investigating whether it's even going to be a reality or not before they begin. And this is our problem on the planet, is that we are so blocked emotionally that we can't even allow ourselves to investigate the possibility that what we think is real and what we think we know and what we think we understand clearly and everything is actually might need to be extended a bit. And, and we might need to change it. And in fact, some of it we might, and in fact, the whole majority of it, might, we might need to grab it and throw it out, you know, like, <laughs> and, and say, oh, that, you know, 
that worked while I was there, but it's not working anymore because it's not the truth anymore. So, what I need to do myself is allow myself to experiment with the possibility of truth all the time. Don't discount things just because of an emotional condition of wanting to hold on to a specific thing inside of yourself. Now, if I do that, and you do that, and everyone on the planet starts doing that, we'll all start looking at the possibility of being able to love. You see, the biggest problem that we have on the planet is none of us really believe in the possibilities of love. You know, quite often many people come up to me, you know, what would you do if your wife was being raped in front of your eyes, so Mary's being raped in front of your eyes, wouldn't you pick up a gun and if you had a gun, or if they had a gun, wouldn't you fight him for the gun and try to kill him, you know, or stop him? And I'm saying, no, I wouldn't. And they go, no, I can't understand that. That's stupid. And they walk off. Now, that's where you'll need to be in the end. But if you think about it, if all of us were there, would there ever be any violence perpetrated towards anyone? Under any circumstances, whether provocative or not. There wouldn't be, would there? If we're all in that place, you see. And this is what we need to consider, is that many of us are still so resistive to the principles of love because we are afraid. We are afraid of things that are not even true. You know, many of us are afraid because we think we can die. Right? And many of us say, oh, no, no, I understand you can't die. No, but hang a sec, no, no. Understanding isn't here. <laughs> understanding is here in your heart, not in your head. So, so uh, do I have a fear for my life in any way? Well, then I'm not understanding here in my heart that I can't die. And you get to, to understand here in your heart, you've got to release quite a lot of emotion to get to that point where you understand it in your heart. But if you can focus on the truth all the time, no matter what's happening around you, you will get to that place. But if you don't focus on the truth all the time, what's happening around you, you won't get to that place. Yeah. So it's so important that you focus on allowing your, the truth to be part of your practice in your life without fear. And when I say without fear, I mean without acting upon your fear, without living in your fear. Because the truth is you're all going to have fear. We're all going to have fear until we release it, until we come to understand the truth. There will always be fear present. But if we can get past that point, it'd be wonderful. Long-winded answers. Oh, shocking, aren't they? Having to wait through the fear, my fear is, yeah, it gets intense. AJ, I wanted to ask a question about the um, three new um, reincarnated souls that you talked about. Yep. Six, uh, six people, yep. Yeah, six people, okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, tr that's right. So one of those half souls I'm getting a strong sense of um, and a bit of a sense about two um, of the others. Um, and I'm wanting to ask if um, um, the parents, the current parents, um, knew the history or, you know, th that fact about these souls, half souls, um, and they work through their emotions about all these issues of reincarnation, about spirit, about everything. Fear. That, so yeah. Yep. So that seems to me that would be a, the really beneficial thing to help these souls to have the experience that they're wanting. Yes, yeah. definitely. Thank you. Yep. As it is with any child, yeah. not just with those. Sure. So yeah. what you say applies to any child, let alone a person who's reincarnated. Yeah. Mm. If I have a sense of, of truth about this, then I feel that... I need to speak the truth to, who, you know, about this to um, anyone I have a sense about. Yes, that. but um, bear in mind that they may not be in this country. Yeah, 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 yeah. I get a sense about one of these. None of those three are in this country. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Oh, well, that clarifies. But that shouldn't prevent you from speaking the truth. Yeah. Because the truth is that parents' beliefs and parents' emotional condition all have an effect on any child. Yeah. 
So why aren't we speaking the truth to every parent, okay. not just the parent of one of the 14 or one yeah, of somebody yeah, who's yeah, reincarnated? Yeah, 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 yeah. Why aren't okay. we, is there some kind of elitist thing going on inside of us that causes us to want to speak the per truth to that particular person who we believe might be affected? Yeah. But what about the other hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of parents that are surrounding us in my private in yeah. my private day-to-day -day life that I'm not speaking the truth to? Yeah. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. But so, that, so have a look at that. Yeah, and that gives me um, good feedback on this, the information I'm getting from mm. Spirit too. So, yeah. yeah, thanks for that. The key, the key with all of the information we receive, oftentimes you've got to remember while we're developing that it's very influenced by us emotions. Right? So there's feelings that we have. Now, many of the children that um, are being born now and are, and are incarnating for the first time now are incredible individuals. Um, the reason why is because they have the, the parents, th this generation of parents, believe it or not, have the least amount of emotional baggage of every generation that's ever lived, right back nearly until Ammon and a man. Right? So, so if you can imagine that for a moment, that means that every new child that's born in this generation is going to be, and particularly if it's born to parents with without who have got less fear or less other, of other emotions in them, then, then what's going to happen, these ch children are going to excel. Right? They're also going to be highly sensitive, highly emotionally sensitive individuals. And these are the kind of children that you call crystal children or indigo children. Or, and, those, and really they are in their first incarnation still, but now many of them are heavily influenced by spirits who are guiding them as well because they're very open. Many of the parents in this generation are quite open spiritually in the sense of allowing of spiritual connections. That causes the child to be quite connected to spirits. So many of these children are spouting off this and spouting off that and they're actually spouting off the knowledge, if you like, of their guide through them to you that you could have the option of choosing to follow or not. You know? And it's wonderful. Like, it's not a bad thing, but it's important to understand what's actually happening. Mm. So if we go to Josh. What's the time? Quarter six. Yes. All right. I'm, I'm just getting a real strong impression to ask a question that's relevant to everything. All right. Um, it's about, um, I was talking to Tristan before the talk this morning, mm -hmm. and he was telling me about how your second eldest son, um, you felt that he was one of the 14. Is that true? Um, no, it's not really true. Um, what I felt was that um, there was a girl that I felt he was, he was dating at the time that I thought was one of the 14. And because they both felt they were soulmates, Tris, uh, Caleb then felt that he might be as well. Does that make sense? Um, the girl, the girl that he was dating, I had a pretty strong connection with because she was actually guided by Anne Rollins, who was one of the celestial spirits who spent a lot of time with me. And so what I did was I misinterpreted her, her, uh, the feelings coming from her as if she was Anne Rollins. And, uh, and then as I worked through the emotions about that, I realised that actually Anne was her guide and, not, and not, she wasn't Anne Rollins herself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. I'm just also getting a lot of um, just outside stuff saying, just trying to raise awareness about how much we're putting expectation on you about being perfect. Yep. Um, and um, there's something else that was... And can I just point out, Josh, that one of the reasons why we came back to was to also demonstrate that you don't need to be perfect to eventually connect to God perfectly and where you will get to a stage of perfection in this process. The whole, when you become at one with God, you become perfect in the, as well. Right? That's a part of the process. But to begin the process, you don't need to be perfect. And there's this common concept that you have to be perfect from day one and that in the first century I was perfect from day one. And you know, there's this common concept of the immaculate conception that's been a big, a big uh, problem really with regard to becoming at one with God because there's this belief that I was unique in human history as a result of the immaculate conception that meant somehow I was God and so there was no, no longer be any person that was like me in the, in the future and things like that. These are all misconceptions about me and my nature and actually how at one with God is achieved. And so many of the, um, 
questions associated with that are all about that group of emotions, about the group of emotions surrounding the issue of us requiring perfection of somebody else or even of ourselves. So what I've been trying to illustrate to you is that I, I have said plenty of times that I make mistakes and I'm still going to continue making mistakes until I'm at one with God. Does that make sense? As, by the way, will you. Now, if I cut you the slack of making mistakes, why can't you cut me the slack? Do, do you see? There must be an emotional reason why you can't cut me the slack. And what's the emotional reason? Oh, I expect him to be, Jesus is perfect, so therefore I expect him, if he says he's Jesus, he should be perfect. That's the emotional reason why you can't cut me slack. But I can cut you slack, like there's been times when you've been angry with me and upset with me and I still love you, like, and I still care about you and still talk to you and I don't get in a rage back with you and all those kind of things, so I've cut you plenty of slack. So why can't you do the same with me? And the reason why, most of the time, is because we have deep internal emotional beliefs that perfection is required of us before we can ever be approved of. And this comes from our childhood and from our relationship with our parents. There is, on, the, on the earth today, there's very, very little unconditional love. Every bit of love generally that comes from parents and families and culture and environment is all very conditional on our belief system, on, on what we do, how we grow our hair, what we look like, all sorts of conditions are placed upon us. And what we need to do is get beyond those and into this place where we start realising that all of us are allowed to make mistakes. You're allowed to make... And God, in fact, is not a cruel God. God does not punish you for your mistakes. Now, your parent may have, and many times your parent probably did, right? Your parents probably did punish you for your mistakes. But God doesn't do that. Mistakes are to something to learn from. My feelings are, the more mistakes I make, the better it is, the faster I grow and I get there. And now I had to come to terms with that emotionally because I actually went through these emotions of, all right, yeah, I can see I'm in a pretty bad state. You know, I wanted to kill myself not long ago, you know, five or six, oh, it was a bit longer than that now, it's about 13, 13 years ago. I wanted to kill myself 13 years ago. That's a pretty bad state. How many of you have been there, by the way? Yeah, so it's not an unusual state. <laughs> but it's a pretty bad state, emotionally. Right? So that's where I was. And I go, yeah, I can just imagine what everyone's going to do with this when I say I'm Jesus. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And I had to work through the emotion of, all right, am I allowed to be in that state, even if I'm Jesus? Am I allowed to be in this other, you know, in a state where, you know, I wasn't balanced with the way that I brought up my boys? Am I, was I allowed to be in that state, even though I'm Jesus? You know, I had a group of, we had a group of nuns who came to speak with us through Mary one night. And we started speaking, you know, and they were, it was to do with sexual matters. And anyway, I started talking about the soulmates and everything, and they thought it was wonderful, and they started crying. They were in the second sphere state in the spirit world, and they actually had turned off all of their attractions to the opposite gender and all their attractions to soulmates through their whole life on earth. And all their life, by the way, through the spirit world as well, up until that point. And I started talking to them about this. And they had lots of overwhelming emotions about crying and everything about, isn't it wonderful and everything. And then they said, but you're saying you're Jesus. I said, yes. But you've had, three, you've had three sex with three different women. Yes. <laughs> but if you were Jesus, you wouldn't have had sex with three different women. Right? So straight away... Right? There's an expectation. Now, now, many of you have had sex with three different women. I don't mean at the same time. And, <laughs> and I don't criticise you for that. Right? Once you open up your soul emotionally and, and, and open up your heart emotionally, you'll get to the point where you only desire one woman, that's your soulmate, just like I have desired one woman once I opened my heart in that manner. Right? But how, how does that preclude me from being Jesus in any way? Honestly. Like, there's only the judgment. And, and while I judge you for it or you judge me for it, we're not recognising inside of ourselves that that's something preventing us from being at one with God through that process. And it's preventing us from being in a state of unconditional love with our brothers and sisters. So many people on this planet have sexually molested their sons or daughters. Right? When are you going to love them? I don't mean love their sons and daughters. I mean love those people who have molested their sons and daughters. 
when are you going to love them? Right? Many people have been murderers on this planet. Some of them have been so bad murderers that they've committed genocides on this planet. When are you going to love them? Because we need to love them if we're going to get through all of this at some point. We need to get to a point that's how much love we have. When are we going to love them? And I don't mean loving what they do, because we can still say, no, what you did was wrong. But we can love them and we can have feeling, a, fe a feeling of fellow feeling for them and compassion for where they're going, what they're going through and what they're going to need to go through in terms of repentance in order to get beyond it. Right? And we can feel these emotions in them. So, so yes, I agree, Josh, many people have had a lot of judgment with me and I've had to deal with all of that emotionally. But I've also had to come to terms with this whole principle that I don't have to be perfect before God loves me. It's also that because you aren't perfect, that's, this is always a good opportunity for us to feel our doubt, what, what's out creating the doubts, and that's yep. what this is all about. Really. Well, I can tell you categorically that even when I are, am perfect, many of you will continue to have doubts until you deal with those doubts. Your doubts are not dependent on my perfection. How many people in the first century doubted I was the Messiah? Thousands of the people I talked to, right? How many people do you think I've met in the spirit world when I go to say, oh, I'm Jesus, and they say, oh, I'm sorry, but I can't believe that. And I was perfect at the time. So I can understand how hard it must be for yourselves when I'm not perfect, when even when I was perfect, the majority of people still found it difficult to accept what I was saying to them. Right? So the truth is it's not dependent on me being perfect as to whether you respond to, hear the truth and act upon it. You've got to start trusting your own feelings about, is this the truth inside of your soul? Is the law of attraction the truth? Is the law of cause and effect the truth? Is the law of desire the truth? What do you feel inside of yourself? And if you do feel it's there inside of yourself, why aren't you acting upon it? Because then you actually find out what is the truth in the end anyway. So can you see, it's t completely independent of who I am and what state I am in as to whether you follow what's being taught you. Completely independent. Now, of course, it makes a big difference if my life as a personal example displays to you what love is and displays to you like the growth that I've had over the period of time you've known me and you can see that it's working for you, well that also adds to the faith that you have to deal with all of these things in your own life. But it still is independent of whether you want a relationship with God on your own rights or not, on your own behalf or not. I had to make that choice in the first century. There was no one around me who said, oh, I'll show you how to become at one with God. I had to make the choice because of my desire for God that I was going to do everything I possibly could to, to learn about God, to get closer to God, to learn about and trust that he was teaching me all of these lessons that he was teaching me at the time. And I had to do that without somebody saying, oh, I'm the Messiah or I'm Jesus, follow me. Right? I had to do that. You can do that too. You can do that too. But it's going to require a very passionate desire to connect to God to do it. Does that make sense? Now it's six o'clock, so I really need to stop. So I'm sorry about that. Um, and can I just say uh, thank you again to all of you who um, have donated your funds and so forth. We're using them as wisely as we can um, to, uh, to actually get a lot of DVD stuff going and things like that. Um, I'm going to make a comment about Mary's workshops.